for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip James, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. James. Got a job for you. I'm available. This is an arson case. We insure the business of a Mr. Lester Matson. Plastics. Old factory burned down. $700,000. Police found definite evidence that rules out accident. How was it set? Some kind of high-octane fuel. Any suspects? No, not yet. Lieutenant Ridgeway at New York headquarters will fill in the details. When can you leave? Oh, a couple of hours. Fine. Good luck, Johnny. Mind if I break in here for a moment to say a few words? Just the other day, I was having lunch with a group of newspaper reporters. We were talking about the government and what goes into its operation when a thought struck me. It's a funny thing, I said. They call one branch of the government the State Department when it handles all of our foreign affairs. Can any of you fellows explain that? Well, one of the reporters who writes political news piped up and said, actually, the State Department does more than handle foreign affairs. It also publishes all of the laws that have been passed by Congress and issues all the passports and visas for anyone traveling outside the United States. Well, just then the waitress brought us our coffee and she entered the conversation. Don't forget, she said, if you're ever on a quiz show, you can maybe win a trip to the moon by telling them that the State Department has the job of making sure the great seal of the United States doesn't get lost. And it acts sort of like a governmental Emily Post, too. While she was making out our checks, she added this bit of information. Did you ever hear of the Division of Protocol? That's part of the State Department, too. It's the outfit that makes sure foreign diplomats who visit America get introduced the way they should and get seated in the right places at official dinners and things like that. Well, after she gave us all that information, we tipped her and went back to work. And now I think it's time we got back to our program. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lester Matson matter. Expense account item one, $17.55. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived in New York, registered at a hotel, and rented a car, which I drove to police headquarters. Lieutenant Ridgeway was a tall, nice-looking man with a pleasant smile and a firm handshake. Glad to help you as much as I can, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Thanks, Lieutenant. Now, how much do you know so far? Only that the Matson plastic factory burned down. Not all the way, but nearly. And that you suspect arson? Positively. We made our report to your company, Mr. Uh, James. Yeah. He told me about the high-octane fuel. Mm-hmm, in a ten-gallon can. The night watchman heard the explosion, but by the time he got there, the fire was out of control. He could see the can and the fuel burning. He could smell it, too. No suspects? No, not yet. Any leads? The owner. You think he did it? No, no, he couldn't have. He was with his daughter at a dinner party. Then you think he had someone else? No, 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 I don't think so. But you said he was a suspect. No, no, I said I had a lead. He's it. Something wrong, Dollar. I don't know what it is. First, I just put it down to the natural behavior of a man who just lost his business. Later on, when I talk with him further, well, I can't really put my finger on it, but I think he's hiding something. He knows something about that fight. He's scared. And that's it? Yeah, that's it. I'm pretty sure he didn't have anything to do with it. It's too successful. Nice bank account, wonderful home, wonderful daughter. Well, the factory was really worth a whole lot more than what he'll collect on the insurance, wasn't it? Well, that's what Mr. Uh... Uh, your boss. A uh, James. Yeah, James. That's what he said. The assets of the business were in the millions. Yeah. Well, if anything, this will really be tough on Matson. Have to build again. Dyes, molds. Well, I think I'll stop out and see him. Yeah. Let me know what you think. I'll do that. The Matson home was across the river in Jersey a big white colonial with a long circular drive that led up to the front door. A butler showed me into a spacious study, and I was told Mr. Matson would be down shortly. 
While I waited, I walked around and cased some of the first editions on the bookshelves. Oh. Hello. Hello, I'm Christine Matson. I'm Johnny Dollar, Miss Matson. I'm waiting for your father. Oh? Yeah. I'm uh, an insurance investigator. Insurance investigator? About the fire. Oh, yes. You have a beautiful house. Well, thank you. Beautiful. Wonderful collection of books. Mm, yes. I don't imagine one person could read them all. Not in a lifetime. No, I suppose not. Do you like to read, Mr. Uh... Dollar? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so bad with names. So am I. Yes, I like to read, but I don't get much time. Been playing tennis, huh? Mm-hmm. And just got back. Do you? Not anymore. I used to play a little. Well, I... Uh... I guess I'd better get upstairs. Nice meeting you. It's nice meeting you. Will you be staying... I mean, will you be around for any length of time while you're investigating the fire? Well, that's hard to say. I hope so. Hello, Chris. Oh, hi, Dad. How was the game? Fine. Mr. Dollar? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Lester Matson. How do you do? Uh, you two have met? Yes. Yes, I was just on my way upstairs. See you later, Dad. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Well, uh, your company notified me you'd be coming down, Mr. Dunlap. Uh, have a seat. You're uh, an investigator. That's right. Well, the police have already made a pretty thorough investigation. Yes, I've talked with Lieutenant Ridgway. Well, I can't tell you any more than I've already told them. You were at a party the night of the fire? That's correct. It's all in the report. With your daughter? Yes. When did you find out about the fire? When I arrived home. I... Mr. Dollar, I explained to that you... That you said that... everything to the police, yes. That's right. There's absolutely nothing I can possibly add... Mr. Matson, you're insured with my company for a lot of money. Hmm. Hardly what I lost in the fire. I'm aware of that. But I have a job to do, and this is an arson case. That's what the police say. A night watchman says so, uh, too. He could have been mistaken in the excitement. He could very Mr. easily... Matson, what difference does it make? It makes a great deal of difference. Your factory burned. You've suffered a considerable loss. I certainly have. I can understand how that would make a difference. But a fire is a fire. If you didn't have anything to do with it... I most certainly did not. Then why so much concern about whether it was deliberately set or not? Well, wouldn't you be concerned if somebody deliberately set fire to one of your factories? About the fire, yes. But buildings burn down all the time. Fires are started deliberately all over the country. I am sure... This one was an accident. Well, accident or the work of a pyromaniac. If you're clear, you'll get the insurance. You, uh... You think this is the work of a pyromaniac? Seems like a pretty reasonable assumption. But you're sure it was an accident? Oh, I... I don't know. I, uh, just don't like the idea of a fire like that being started deliberately. I admit it's a little frightening. Yes, yes. You have to understand... A business like mine, so many inflammables, it's a little terrifying to think someone would deliberately start a fire. Well, what if it had happened during working hours? That's not very probable. Well, I've read about fires in hotels, people burned to death, deliberately started by some madman. Yes, the firebug would have a good chance in a hotel. He wouldn't be seen so easily. Most of the people in their rooms, and he could get in and out easily. And most of those fires are started during the night sometime. But a busy factory in the daytime isn't very likely. Hmm. Well, I, I sincerely hope you're right. I'm just going by the records. Well, you see, I, uh, I have two more plants. Let's hope I don't turn out to be the exception to the rule. I doubt it. Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Matson, I've still got to make a full report to my company. Oh, uh, certainly. I'll give you all the information I can. Lieutenant Ridgway had been right. Something was troubling Matson. Until I had suggested the possibility of a fire bug, he was determined to convince me the fire was simply an accident, and he'd been resentful of the impending interrogation. Then the pyromaniac angle had given him some kind of an out, because he'd relaxed immediately. While I questioned him about the details of the fire, he seemed actually cheerful, he even resurrected a few old bromides that I politely chuckled along with. But he told me nothing I hadn't already learned from the lieutenant. So I thanked him, shook his hand at the front door, and climbed back into my car. As I drove off, I felt sorry I couldn't have seen the daughter again, because it was certainly a sight worth seeing again. 
and again. I arrived back at the hotel, went up to my room, and put in a call to Lieutenant Ridgway. What'd you think? Yeah, something's bothering him. Yeah, yeah, I know, but what? Did you ever mention the possibility of a fire bug having been responsible for the fire? To Matson? Yeah. No, I don't think I did. Well, I mentioned it to him, and he liked it. What do you mean? Until I did, he was determined to call the whole thing an accident. When I suggested a pyro, he made a complete about-face. Oh, he was subtle about it, but he forgot the accident theory. Isn't that right? Yeah. He seemed actually relieved. Oh. What do you think it means? I don't know. It could mean he knows who started the fire. If he thought we were looking for a pyro and not some specific person that could incriminate him, that would account for his letting go of the accident theory. I see. He agree with the pyro theory and hope we do the same. Oh, what could he gain? Financially, he ends up in a hole. Yeah. Insurance doesn't figure. No, no. He's loaded. Got all the money he needs. And it's something else. Somebody started that fire, and I'm pretty sure Matson knows who and why. Yeah, now all we've got to do is find the who and why. Well, I don't mind working on the case for a while. Have you seen his daughter? Uh, Yeah. Maybe she started the fire. Why would she do that? She's the type that could. I just met her for a minute, and I'm still smoldering. Lieutenant suggested a stakeout for Lester Matson. I told him I'd check with him later, took the cold shower, changed, and went down to the hotel bar to freshen up a bit. It was about 4.30, and I was pretty fresh when a page came wandering through calling my name. He told me I was wanted on the phone. Johnny Dollar. This is Christine Matson. Mr. Dollar? Yes. Hello. I found out where you were staying from your company. Well, that's nice. Why did you find out where I was staying from my company? Well, it's very important that I talk to you. All right. Where are you? I don't want to meet you at your hotel. I I have to be very careful. Well, so do I. That's not what I mean. If certain parties saw me with you, my father's life would be in danger. Is this about the fire? Yes, it is. Would you meet me at the corner of 5th and 115th Street in a half hour? Sure. I'll be in a cab. I'll pick you up. I'll be the guy with the fire extinguisher. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He has been called a lawyer by profession, a fighter by choice, and a politician by force of circumstance. And he was outstanding in all three fields. In 1788, at the age of 21, he was appointed public prosecutor for the region which is now Tennessee. As president, he was the first to introduce the National Convention for the nomination of presidential candidates. During his campaign for the presidency, his opponents attempted to smear him by an unwarranted attack on his wife, Rachel, who never recovered from the ordeal and died just before her husband's inauguration. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more clue. During the Battle of New Orleans, as Major General of the Army, he accepted the help of the pirate Jean Lafitte. Who was he? Andrew Jackson, 7th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. As long as the lovely Miss Matson was picking me up in a cab, I left the rented car behind and charged up expense account item two. $1.65 for cab fare from the hotel to 5th and 115th Streets. It was getting dark by the time I arrived. I waited for about 10 minutes until Christine Matson's cab pulled up at the curb and she opened the door for me. Go ahead, driver. Well, good evening. Is this a terrible inconvenience? Oh, not a bit. Where are we going? 
I just told him to drive around. Mr. Dollar, my father's being blackmailed. In connection with the fire? He had nothing to do with the fire, Mr. Dollar. But he knows who did. Yes. They burned the factory to frighten him, to make him pay the blackmail. You mean someone's shaking him down? Well, about a week ago, he was approached by two men. They demanded he pay them a certain percentage of the profits from his business. In return for the percentage, they guaranteed him protection. So he didn't pay, and they set fire to the factory? That's it. Why didn't he go to the police? Well, he was frightened. Well, he couldn't have been too frightened if he refused to pay them. He was frightened for me. He thought maybe he could bluff them by not paying, but he didn't want to take a chance and go to the police for fear they might really do something serious. Losing a million-dollar business is pretty serious. He tried to bluff them, and it didn't work. Now he's really frightened. He knows they mean business, and they've told him if the police ever find out, they'll do something a whole lot worse than just start a fire. Do something to you? That's what Dad's afraid of. And you're not? Of course I am. Aren't you taking a pretty big chance telling me about it? Well, you're not the police. And I have been very careful. I was hoping you could help without it being necessary to start a wide-open police investigation. You're not giving the police much credit. If you'd told them the same story, they'd have kept it completely undercover. Oh, I thought about it, but too many people would have to know about it. And there's always the chance of someone saying something or, or a slip-up. How do you know about all this? Well, my father told me, of course. Just like that? Daughter, darling, two men have been trying to oh, blackmail me? Oh, don't be silly. He said nothing at first. He kept it from me. But you see, my father and I are very close, Mr. Dollar. We've never had any secrets. After the fire, when I saw how disturbed he was, I made him tell me. Does he know you've come to see me? Oh, no, no. He made me promise not to tell anyone. Well, I just had to. He's agreed to pay the men. You know what that means. Mr. Dollar, will you help? Well, I'll do what I can, but it's going to be tough without your father's cooperation. And you'll never be safe until these men are caught. He's afraid of what might happen before they're caught. Why, if they find out... There's no middle of the road in something like this. He's got to understand that. I think he does, but... Well, he'd rather lose everything than lose me. I'm all he's got. And he's pretty important to you, isn't he? More than anything in the world. Without his cooperation, I doubt if I'll be able to do much. And if he gives in to this, a man like your father... It'll keep growing until it kills him. Well, what do you want me to say? Tell the driver to take us to your father. Say it's all right for me to talk to him. All right, Mr. Dollar. She looked as though she might cry, but she didn't. She gave the driver her address, then sat back in the seat and kept looking straight ahead while the cab headed across the bridge for New Jersey. Expense account item three, $11.75 cab fare, which I insisted upon paying after we arrived at the Matson home. The butler met us at the door, and Chris led me into the study where her father rose to greet us. Hello, Dad. Uh, hello, my dear. Mr. Dunner. Good evening, Mr. Matson. Dad, I told Mr. Dollar. I had to. Believe me, Mr. Matson, it's the best thing. Chris? Yes. My dear girl, this... This can be very serious. Dad, it's already serious. I know, I know, but... but tell me, do you intend to bring in the police, Mr. Dollar? I promised your daughter I wouldn't. Unless it was absolutely necessary. I see. Uh, you... You know everything? Yes, Dad. I told him everything. But you've said nothing to the police as yet? No, I haven't. Oh. Mr. Dolly, if these men find out that you know... Who are these men, Mr. Matson? Mr. Dolly, I would like to tell you something. In the past, I've always confided in my daughter. This time I hesitated because of the, the possible consequences. But nevertheless, I, I told her. I did so with the provision that she keep the affair a complete secret. Oh, Dad. Uh, I, I'm not angry, my dear. Believe me. I'm sure you did what you thought was best. Unfortunately, you just didn't realize the gravity of the situation. Well, certainly I realized dear, it. Dear, you couldn't have. You couldn't have. These men aren't fooling. They've already destroyed a million-dollar business. It was just lucky there wasn't anyone in the building. So you're going to give them what they want? Yes, Mr. Dollar, 
I am. You can't win. I'm not expecting to win. I'm just thinking of my business, my family. What would you do in the same situation, Mr. Dollar? I think you'd do exactly what I'm doing. I don't think so. That's easy to say. Look, Mr. Matson, I know you're in a tough spot. You said these men aren't fooling, and you're right. They'll do anything to scare you into paying their blackmail. They'll burn down a building, threaten you and your family, even kill if it comes to that. But you wouldn't do what I'm doing? Maybe. If I had some assurance, it would stop there. But don't you know what happens once you give in to them? Don't you think I've thought about that? Don't you think I've considered every possibility? They'll bleed me and bleed me until there's nothing left. I realize that. But there's no alternative. It's that or... You're or... afraid they'll kill me. Chris. Chris, you're my whole life. Well, then, Dad, consider me a little. Consider? Good Lord, that's what I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. Not now. What about a year from now? Two years? Five years? Dad, if you give in to these men, what will it do to you? What will you have left five years from now? The business doesn't matter. I'm not talking about the business. We can both get along without the business if we have to. We did once, we can do it again. I'm talking about you. What will happen to you if you give in to this terrible blackmail? There'll be nothing left of you. It'll kill you. Mr. Matson. In some states, there's a death penalty for kidnapping. But this kind of blackmail is worse than that. These men kidnap the one thing that people like you and me can't live without. Freedom. My daughter's life is worth my freedom seven days a week, Mr. Dollar. If that happened, I'd just as soon be dead. Daddy, it would ruin you, and that most certainly would ruin me. There'd be nothing left of us, nothing of what we had. We'd, we'd just be alive. Makes a lot of sense, Mr. Matson. I hope you'll see it and help me get these men. But whether you do or don't, I've got a job. I'll try to steer clear of the police as long as I can because I made a promise to your daughter. But I'm going to try and get those guys. They have to be gotten. Dad, please. I don't know, Chris. I... All right. Oh, Dad. Who are the men, Mr. Matson? <laughs> shot tore through the window and caught Matson in the chest. There was a swell punctuation point for my pep talk on freedom. Before Matson hit the rug, I was on my way to the study door with my gun in my hand. Outside, I circled to the spot near the window where the gunman had been standing. I stopped and listened. From inside the house, I could hear Christine Matson phoning for a doctor. And from not too far away, toward the front of the house, I heard a car start. I ran out to the drive and spotted the car pulling away about 50 yards from the house. Mr. Dollar! Johnny! Get back in the house, Chris. But Dad's bleeding. I can't stop the bleeding. How bad is it? I can't tell. I called Dr. Phillips. Well, get back in that house and wait. I got the car, but there's a man in that car with a shotgun. He may still be able to use it. Now go on. I started down the driveway for the wrecked car. It was on its side, wrapped around a big oak. The only thing moving was the right front wheel, still spinning slowly. I reached the car and looked in. The shotgun, twisted by the impact, lay on the floor. The man who'd fired it was halfway through the windshield, his life running out all over the hood. The driver's seat was empty. Don't open it. I'll turn around. Hand your gun back over your shoulder. Okay. I'll walk back to the house. Police will be coming any minute. I just want a car. We'll borrow one of Mr. Matson's. How far do you think you'll get? Not how far I'm going to get. How far we're going to get. You're an insurance man. You're going to be my insurance. You're going to get us just as far as you can. It all depends what your life's worth to the law. I couldn't see his face. 
kept behind me with his gun pointed at my back. We went around to the other side of the house to the garage and stopped. He shoved the gun hard into my spine. Open the door. As I started to open the big garage door, a car swung in the driveway, and we were suddenly framed in the glare of its headlights. I knew it was the doctor. The man with the gun in my back didn't. He turned, expecting the police. <laughs> Doctor? Yes. Your patient's in the house. Lester Matson lived and later identified both men as those that had tried to shake him down. They both had long records. Both had done time. The man with the shotgun was named Ernie Starbuck. The other, Stan Cole. Starbuck they buried in Potter's Field, while Cole looked unhappy. Not because he'd lost a partner more because he'd gained a new one, a cellmate in Sing Sing he'd have to put up with for the rest of his natural life. After the doctor said her father was out of danger, I went back over to Jersey to say goodbye to Christine Matson. Do you have to go right away? Well, case closed. Expense account likewise. You, um, you live in Hartford? Yeah. Sometimes I drive up that way. Oh? That would be nice. When does your train leave? 4.30. I don't catch that one. There's not another one until 12.15. Oh. Will you be saying goodbye to Dad? I thought I'd stop by the hospital on my way to the station. Are you going in to see him? Mm-hmm. Drive in with me. We can see him together. Maybe have a quick drink afterwards. I don't like quick drinks. No. Johnny. Yeah? Would it make so much difference if you took the later train? Oh, it sure would. But, uh, I'll take it. Expense account items four and five. $103.75 car rental and hotel bill. Item six, $19.80, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $154.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were John Larch, Bill Lillian Bayef, Hal March, and William Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring John Lund, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.